Well, <clears throat> welcome back. It's uh, been a little while, it's been about three weeks since we've uh, done a lesson on this. Our, our topic, of course, being Satan, the deception is real based on uh, the book that I've written, uh, Satan as he wants to be seen, which could be uh, obtained by going to amazon.com, <clears throat> typing in Satan as he wants to be seen, you can get my book and read the entirety of my book. We're just basically going through excerpts of it and going through some of the teachings. Um, we have been uh, been off for a little while. It's been about three weeks, three three weeks to a month. We've been busy, been doing a number of things. Uh, then also I uh, contacted uh, COVID. So I was down with COVID for about 10 days at the CDC uh, guidelines, isolated. Uh, thank God that the symptoms were very mild. It was just like I had nasal congestion and that was it. No fever, no body aches, nothing like that. So we're thankful for that, but that, uh, that put a, a hold on our recording sessions. You'll notice that my beautiful better half is not with us right now. She had other things to do today. And so I want to do probably a couple of videos to get caught up on where we were. And so we want to continue on with our lesson I normally do a short recap, but uh, we're not gonna do that right now. Uh, if you would refer to the other videos on my uh, YouTube channel, and then you'll get caught up to speed on what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about prophecy and context also, because it's important to get the context of what is being said about Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Uh, the context, uh, you know, because Jeremiah talks about it, Isaiah speaks, it, mentions it, and Ezekiel talks about these events. And so uh, it's, it's best to get the, the contextual understanding uh, so that we can get a better understanding of what scriptures are actually saying about these two events. So we'll continue on with our prophecy and context and then we'll launch into, we'll be reading uh, Ezekiel chapter number 25 today and going through talking about the judgment of the nations. So at last we left talking, uh, we talked about how uh, Jeremiah made a prediction that that uh, uh, Judah was going to go into the Babylonian captivity for 70 years. But he also mentions that other nations will also be a part of that. And he sent a message to all those nations saying that they will be in captivity uh, to Babylon and they will serve the king of Babylon. They will serve Nebuchadnezzar, his sons and his son's sons and be there for 70 years. And so he mentioned some of those nations and so also these nations some of these nations came against uh, israel and when they came against israel then god brought judgment upon them so let's go through this prophecy of context some of these nations once honored god and respected israel when they did god spoke well of them but when they became lifted up with pride god brought them down the reason for each nation's judgment is given and this is what's interesting about uh, Ezekiel, uh, it, it's important to get the context of it because Ezekiel actually gives the reasons behind God judging these nations. He lists them by name, and then he gives the reason of their offense against Israel and, and primarily against God. And so then, which prompted the judgment. Let's look at the first one being, being Ammon. Well, who was Ammon? The descendants of Abraham's nephew, Lot. That's who they are. Remember, Ben Ami was uh, the son of Lot's youngest daughter, the father of the Ammonites. Uh, we all know the story about what happened with Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. The only survivors of Sodom and Gomorrah were Lot and his two daughters. And then Lot and his two daughters plotted this horrible scheme. Certainly, it seems uh, horrible to our generation uh, that a father would impregnate two of his daughters. Absolutely unthinkable. But it was certainly a different time. We know the story would happen. Uh, and so the youngest daughter had been Ammi. He became the father of the Ammonites. And if we remember, let's just trace the history of the Ammonites with the Israelites that leads us up to our current study in Ezekiel, where uh, he passes judgment on them. So we know that the children of Israel were instructed not to disturb the Ammonites after being delivered from Egypt. Then also throughout their history, they fought against Israel during the days 
of the judges. We know that um, one of the judges, uh, Jephthah, was a champion that delivered the Israelites from the Ammonites. Then also David was friends with Nahash, the Ammonite king at one time. But after Nahash's death, Nahash's son, Hanun, betrayed his father's friendship with David. And if anyone is familiar with the story of that, David sent ambassadors to Hanun to basically offer condolences to his, the, the death of his father. Nahash had died. Nahash was, was David's friend. So he sent basically to comfort Hanun and some of his wicked advisors says, you know, he's not coming here offering condolences. He's going to come here and try to or take you over. And so then uh, Hanun had some of his men shave uh, half of the beards off of David's ambassadors. So they basically humiliated them. They shaved half their beards and then they, they cut off their tunics uh, to their buttocks and sent them away in humiliation. Uh, so again, we see that that relationship certainly deteriorated quickly. But then also Rehoboam, Solomon's son, uh, the king who took over for Solomon after Solomon's departure, uh, his mother was an Ammonitess. So we see the relationship of Israel and Ammon. During the days of Jehoshaphat, the Ammonites joined with the Moabites to attack Judah. We can find that story in 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. Then also, uh, moving forward in history, when Nebuchadnezzar finally came against Jehoiakim, he had a coalition of nations with him, which consisted of the Syrians, the Moabites, and the Ammonites. Then this is where Ezekiel gives the judge, judgment of Ammon. He tells exactly why God was judging. He gives the reason. Uh, he says in verses 2 and 3 of chapter 25, he says, son of man, set your face against the Ammonites and prophesy against them and say unto the Ammonites, hear the word of the Lord God. Thus said the Lord God, because thou said, aha, against my sanctuary, when it was profane and against the land of Israel, when it was desolate and against the house of Judah, when they went into captivity. Verse six, for thus saith the Lord God, because thou hast clapped thine hands and stamped with the feet and rejoiced in heart with all the despite against the land of Israel. So they were rejoicing. These Ammonites have been a long time enemies with Israel, but now when Nebuchadnezzar came against Judah and took them into captivity, Ezekiel is saying that they were rejoicing. They were glad. They were celebrating. As a matter of fact, they were a part of the coalition that came against Israel with Judah. And, um, Ezekiel is saying, bad move, you shouldn't have done this. Then also, now let's look at Moab. Moab was the son of Lot's oldest daughter. And we see again that whole uh, two, Lot's two daughters. Well, the youngest daughter had Ammi, Ben Ammi, which was the father of the Ammonites. The oldest daughter had Moab, which became again, the, the father or descendants of the Moabites. The children of Israel were told also not to harass the Moabites or provoke them to war when they were delivered out of Egypt. So we see when the children of Israel, look at the context of setting in history, when the children of Israel were delivered out of Egypt, they encountered the Ammonites and the Moabites and each time they were told not to mess with them. And so this is the setting here, when they were delivered out of Egypt. Then also remember as we progress forward in time, Balak, the king of Moab, hired Balaam, the false prophet, to curse the children of Israel. So this is Moab. They also oppressed Israel in the days of the judges. So just like the Ammonites oppressed, oppressed Israel in the days of the judges, so did the Moabites. Then also during the days of Saul, when he was king, he killed many Moabites, but did not subdue all of them. Because if we remember, David placed both of his parents under the protection of the king of Moab while he was running away from Saul. But this friendship also did not continue because when David became king, he made war against the Moabites and completely conquered them. And then also Moab joined the Ammonites to fight against Judah in the days of Jehoshaphat that's found in 2 Chronicles chapter number 20. But then also ultimately when Nebuchadnezzar attacks Jehoiakim, 
Moab was there along with the other nations. And so because of that, this is what Ezekiel had to say about Moab. And we're also going to look at what Ezekiel said about Moab and what Jeremiah and some of the other prophets said about Moab. Because if you remember prophecy in context, uh, Ezekiel and Jeremiah are prophesying uh, at the same time uh, during the same events. While, while Jeremiah was in Jerusalem prophesying, Ezekiel was in Babylon prophesying about these same nations. And so this is what Ezekiel had to say about Moab in Ezekiel chapter 25, verse number eight. It says, because that Moab and Seir do say, behold, the house of Judah is likened to all the heathen. In other words, you know, the Bible clearly tells us at this time that Israel was God's chosen people. He chose them above all the nations of the earth. But, but, but the Moabite says, oh no, you know, th th this house of Judah, they're like all the other nations. There's nothing different about them. Well, that's a bad move. Then also look at what Jeremiah said. Jeremiah 48 and 7 says, for, for because thou hast trusted in thy works and in thy treasures, thou shalt also be taken. And Chemosh, which was their God, shall go forth into captivity with his priests and his princes together. And then later on in that chapter of 48 of Jeremiah, it says, Moab shall be destroyed and no longer be a people. Why? Because he magnified himself against the Lord. And so by coming against Israel, by despising Israel, they were coming against the Lord. Then let's look at, move on. Let's look at Edom. Well, all of us know who the Edomites were. Uh, Jacob and Esau were twin brothers born to Isaac and Rebekah. Esau's name was changed to Edom after Jacob stole his birthright. So we know the story behind that. Uh, Jacob stole his birthright, and obviously Esau was very angry with Jacob and wanted to kill him, and Rebekah sent Jacob away to live with Laban for 20 years, and then when he uh, gained his freedom from Laban, then he came back home, and, and then he met up with Esau, and Esau had forgiven him. He was afraid that uh, his brother was going to take revenge on him, but he didn't. Uh, they, they made amends even after that. Well, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. We see that in Genesis chapter number 36, verse 8 through 9. We're not going to read that right now. We'll just have you refer to it. You can stop this video at any time and look up these passages of scripture. Uh, so uh, the Edomites are the descendants of Esau. We learn that from scripture. Also, they would not allow the Israelites to pass through their borders after their exodus from Egypt after the Israelites' exodus from Egypt. And then when Saul became king, uh, he fought against Edom, Ammon, Moab, and the Philistines. All of these individuals that, that Ezekiel is talking about and passing judgment in Ezekiel chapter number 25, they all have a history with Israel. And the Bible clearly gives a, a reason why God is judging them. Then when David became king, he killed 18,000 Edomites in the Valley, valley of Saul. That's the, near the Dead Sea. Joab cut off every male uh, in Edom. Joab was David's general, and he was a bad dude. He was a tough guy, and, and uh, he killed all the, the males in Edom. And in the days of Solomon, Hadad of the royal blood of Edom became a source of trouble for Solomon at the end of Solomon's reign, because, you know, Solomon reigned for 40 years and he had peace throughout his land and not throughout all the regions. And Solomon ruled over all the kings of the earth. But near the end of his reign, uh, when, he is, when his heart was lifted up with pride and filled with the, uh, adultery and idolatry, because the scripture plainly says, uh, Solomon, don't marry all those women because they're going to turn your heart. When you get old, they're going to turn your heart away from God. And, and unfortunately, that did happen. And so then the, the kingdom was taken away from Solomon. But, but before the kingdom was taken away from him, near the end of his life, the, as a fellow by the name of Hadad, who was a royal blood of Edom, he became a source of trouble to Solomon. And then also Edom was a part of that coalition that we mentioned earlier in uh, Second Chronicles chapter number 20. And then, of course, they joined forces with Ammon and Moab 
when Nebuchadnezzar invaded Judah. Uh, so Jacob and Esau resolved their differences as brothers. Their descendants, however, could not achieve the same peace. For this reason, Ezekiel and other prophets declared the judgment of Edom. Look at what Ezekiel says about them in Ezekiel chapter 25. Thus said the Lord God, because that Edom have dealt against the house of Judah by taking revenge and have greatly offended and revenged himself upon them. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will also stretch out my hand upon Edom and will cut off man and beast from it and will make it desolate from Teman. These are some of the cities of the Edomites. And, and they of Dedan shall, be, shall fall by the sword. And I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. And they shall do in Edom according to my anger and according to my fury. And they shall know my vengeance, saith the Lord God. So since the Edomites took re revenge, <coughs> revenge on their brothers Israel, uh, therefore God took revenge on them. And then that, that clause there that says, and, and I will lay my vengeance upon Edom by the hand of my people Israel. This took place during the days of the Maccabees, when the, when, uh, uh, during the time when Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the king of Syria, had uh, ruled over Israel for a long time. And the Maccabees rose up and gained their independence. And during that time period, they, they had their independence for about 100 years. That's when they also subdued Edom. And so that uh, we see prophecy being fulfilled in scripture and in history. Then also notice what Amos says about uh, the Edomites. A Amos prophesied about 760 BC. That's about 20 years before Isaiah and 107 years before Ezekiel makes his prediction in chapter 25. So this is giving again the setting, the context. <coughs> Excuse me. This is what Amos says. Thus saith the Lord. For three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. And then he gives the reason why. Because, because he did pursue his brother with the sword. Who's his brother? The Israelites. And did cast off all pity. He showed Israel no mercy. And his anger did tear perpetually. And he kept his wrath forever. And because he did that against Israel, then God brings judgment. Ezekiel also gives further warning to Edom, also known as Mount Seir, because that's the location. That's where they dwelt. You look at Genesis. Once Esau started his journey and started having children, uh, uh, he also had 12 princes as well. Uh, and they settled in Mount Seir. And so Ezekiel references that in chapter number 35. And he says this, verses 5 through 6. Because you harbored an ancient hostility and delivered the Israelites over to the sword at the time of their calamity, the time their punishment reached its climax. Therefore, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I will give you over to bloodshed and it will pursue you. Since you did not hate bloodshed, bloodshed will pursue you. And so we see this horrible event uh, 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 when Nebuchadnezzar came and took Judah captive, and we learned in past lessons that, that Nebuchadnezzar, there were three raids against Judah, the first one being with Jehoiakim, the second one being under Jehoiakim, and then the last one being under Zedekiah, and then that's when Israel was destroyed, the temple was burned down, the houses of the wealthy people were destroyed, the palaces of the king was destroyed, and the remainder of the people, except for the poor uh, in the land, were left, or, or the remainder of the people were taken into captivity, and they left many poor of the land. Well, while this was happening, Edom was, <clears throat> was in on it. And you, you can imagine the scene, uh, the chaos in the invasion, and people trying to flee and run and get away, and the Edomites would capture them and stop them from getting away and turn them over to their captors, their own brothers. So this is evil. And some of the other prophets uh, tell us that. Uh, Obadiah, for instance, Obadiah was a prophet from Judah, and he specifically prophesied against Edom. He writes about Edom's cruelty towards their brother Israel. And uh, we have it listed, some of this on, on, our, uh, on our screen, so we'll read it 
<clears throat> this is what he says against the Edomites. Because of the violence you did to your close relatives in Israel, you will be filled with shame and destroyed forever. When they were invaded, you stood aloof, refusing to help them. Foreign invaders carried off their wealth and cast lots to divide up Jerusalem. But you acted like one of Israel's enemies. You should not have gloated when they exiled your relatives to distant land. You should not have rejoiced when the people of Judah suffered such misfortune. You should not have spoken arrogantly in that terrible time of trouble. You should not have plundered the land of Israel when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have gloated over their destruction when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have seized their wealth when they were suffering such calamity. You should not have stood at the crossroads killing those who tried to escape. You should not have captured the survivors and handed them over in the time of trouble. Look at how they treated uh, their own brothers. And, and, and he's, Edom said, you should not have done that. Uh, horrible. They Not only did they loot and, and rob and take their opportunity to enter into Israel and take their goods, but they also, when people were trying to escape, they, they took them, they killed some of them, they handed others over to the king of Babylon. What, what a horrible picture. And also look at what the psalm says, uh, the inspired psalmist has to say uh, what Edom did when Jerusalem was being destroyed. Uh, verse number seven says, O Lord, remember what the Edomites did on the day the armies of Babylon captured Jerusalem. So it gives us a, a specific time frame. This took place when the armies of Babylon captured Judah. This was all uh, coinciding together. What did they say? The Edomites said, destroy it. They yelled, level it to the ground. Now let's move on to the Philistines. The Philistines history began in Genesis chapter number 10, which is known as the table of nations. Out of, uh, after the flood, uh, out of Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, the whole world was repopulated. That's what the Bible tells us. That's what we believe. Well, then in, in Genesis chapter 10 is the table of nations. It, it, it describes all of those nations and who they come from, their, their, their um, generations, their genealogies. And then it, that, that leads into chapter number 11, where the Tower of Babel, and then they were scattered all over. These nations that were formed in chapter 10 were scattered all over. Uh, so who are the Philistines? They are the Hamites through his son, uh, Mizram. We know that Ham was one of the sons of, um, uh, uh, well, uh, Shem Ham. They were, uh, Mizram was one of Ham's sons. The Philistine comes out of Kasluthum, one of Mizram's son. So out of one of Ham's son was Mizram, out of Mizram comes the Philistine, out of Kaslum, they became the Philistines. They conquered near the seacoast and were so powerful that none of their towns were taken under Joshua. Joshua was sent to conquer the land of Canaan, and uh, he didn't conquer any of the Philistines. That's how powerful they were. They were the children of Israel's most fierce enemies. Samson, Samuel, Saul, and David fought against these masters of war. Of course, we know the famous story of David the, uh, killed their champion, uh, Goliath. Uh, everyone knows about that, all Sunday school children, and anyone knows, I mean, even the secular world who don't even read the Bible know that David killed Goliath, and that, that, uh, that uh, metaphor is used anytime an underdog goes up against uh, you know, uh, 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 insurmountable odds. They use the whole David-Goliath story, but it was an actual event David went up against Goliath, who stood nine feet tall, and David said, you come at me with a sword and a spear, but I come against you in the name of the Lord, and he took big boy down. Uh, so then also, when, when David was running from Saul, just like when he was running from Saul, he, he uh, kept his parents with the Moabites for a while. Well, he also became the bodyguard to King Achish of the Philistines. But when David became king, he warred with and subdued the Philistines. That can be found in 1 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 4 through 8. And then also they were subject to Solomon all of his life. Remember, 
we talked about when you read Solomon's story, you find that Solomon had peace all throughout the regions and, and he didn't have anybody come against him. He reigned over all the kings of the earth. That would, of course, include the Philistines. But long after Solomon, the Philistines fought with Israel against Ahaz and Hezekiah. And then also the Philistines were with Babylon, Moab, and Ammon when Babylon came to take Judah into captivity. They were also allies of Tyre and Sidon against Judah. Now, this is, this is uh, important to pay attention to. Uh, we're going to see what Jeremiah, we're going to see what Zechariah and Ezekiel and how they, they make these alliances uh, of these nations so that when we get to chapters 26, 27, and 28 of Ezekiel, we'll understand more clearly what Ezekiel is talking about when he prophesies against Tyre. So the Philistines and Tyre and Sidon were allies against Judah. Look at what Jeremiah 47, uh, uh, seven, four says. It says, the day has come to destroy all the Philistines and to remove all survivors who could help Tyre and Sidon. The Lord is about to destroy the Philistines, the remnant from the coast of Kaftar. So we see again, he makes that link with Kaftar uh, um, that we see in the table of nations. But he also shows this alliance of nations that came against Israel, and it all converged upon that, that uh, 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 Babylonian captivity and what, what Jeremiah had to say about that and what Ezekiel has to say about all of these nations. So keep that in mind when we get to Ezekiel 26. Let's look and see what Ezekiel 25 says when, again, about Ezekiel pronouncing judgment upon these nations. And here's what he says about the Philistines. Because the Philistines acted in vengeance and took revenge with malice in their hearts and with ancient hostility sought to destroy Judah. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. I am about to stretch out my hand against the Philistines and I will wipe out the Caryophytes and destroy those remaining along the coast. Those Caryophytes were the, basically the bodyguards, the, the special forces of the Philistines. He says, I will carry out great vengeance on them and punish them in my wrath. Then they will know that I am the Lord when I take vengeance on them. Uh, the, all of these nations, as, as Ezekiel makes these predictions against each of them, he finishes up with that phrase, then they will know that I am the Lord. Then they will know. Ezekiel mentions that phrase about uh, anywhere from 68 to 70 times in his book uh, when, he's, when he makes predictions against Judah, when he makes predictions against all these nations. He ended with, and they shall know. Uh, because, you know, many times in our arrogance, in our, in our hard-headedness, in our stubbornness, sometimes it takes a, a pretty good hard knock from God to get our attention. And so he's saying, when I get done with them, God's saying, when I get done with them, then they'll know uh, who the Lord is. Many times, many of these nations, they thought that their king was God. Uh, they exalted themselves. Uh, they thought more highly of themselves than they ought to. Uh, but Ezekiel said over and over and over, then they will know that I am the Lord. And so that's what he says about the Philistines. And now let's look and see what he says about all the nations who came against Israel. And this is found in Psalm 83. And many times the theologians like to take Psalm 83 and fling it into the future, uh, bring it way into our time, into the 21st century, and, and, and try to make application. But there's no reason to do that, because as we've seen, all of these nations, we started with Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistines, and we're going to get the tire. All of these nations, uh, 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 Syria, Babylon, that came against Israel uh, at that time, during in that setting, during that context, and Psalm 83 mentions that, and then when we're going to look at it, we're going to look at the Psalm, and it mentions all of these nations by name. And so it would certainly be uh, uh, taking the scripture out of context and putting it somewhere else where it doesn't belong, a, a misinterpretation of the word of God. Uh, so certainly Psalm 83 was referring to these events that we're discussing. 
Psalm 83 starts off, it says, God, do not keep silent. Do not be deaf, God. Do not be idle. See how your enemies make an uproar. Those who hate you have acted arrogantly. They devise clever schemes against your people. They conspire against your treasured ones. They say, come, let us wipe them out as a nation so that Israel's name will no longer be remembered. All of these nations wanted to do that. And e e Ezekiel and Amos and Jeremiah, they tell and they explain, they come to wipe out these people. Because some of these nations said, you know, Moab said, oh, Judah is like all the other nations. Let's wipe these people out. Let's get rid of them. That's exactly what Psalm 83 is saying. It goes on, it says, for they have conspired with one mind, these nations. They form an alliance against you. Who are these nations? The tents of Edom and the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarites, which again, the descendants of Hagar, of Ishmael, Gebal, which Ezekiel is going to mention when we get to chapter number 27. He mentions Gabal, that region of uh, the that Phoenicia, Syrophoenician area, Ammon and Amalek, Philistia, with the inhabitants of Tyre. Even Assyria has joined them. Uh, they lend support to the sons of Lot. So we see again that these prophets, when we talk about prophecy in context, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, uh, uh, Amos and all of these other problems, they're, they're speaking of these events, the same events that occurred when Nebuchadnezzar came and took Judah captivity. All of these other nations were involved. Uh, they were a coalition of nations coming against Israel. And so this is exactly what it's talking about. So having said all of that, we still have a little time. Let's move into chapter number 26. Now let's again put things in context. We see in chapter number 25 that Ezekiel is prophesying against Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistines. These were all actual nations who came against Israel, who had some type of relationship with Israel in the past, whether it be good or whether it be bad. They had some type of dealing with them. And so why would Tyrus be any different from those other nations? Well, uh, 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 in, in Ezekiel chapter 25, Ezekiel just deals with, you know, small passages to deal with Moab, just, you know, a couple of verses, whatever, to deal with each of these nations. But when we get to the judgment against Tyrus, it is vital it is necessary that we read chapters 26, 27, and 28 together because all of those passages refer to the judgment of Tyrus. So this is very important to do. When you're talking about going into the text and drawing out the meaning of it rather than going to a text and imposing a meaning on it, uh, that's the best way to interpret any literature, but certainly the word of God. And so having said that, what we're going to do is, and we're just going to have to do it. I, I say it uh, often in many of my teachings, doesn't matter what topic you're studying. It doesn't matter what chapter or verse it is. In order to get the full meaning of anything, if you read the whole story, you get the whole story. If you read a part of the story, you get a part of the story. That, that's just the way it is. The, the, the Bible is a wonderful book inspired by God, written by men. These men wrote as they were moved upon by the Holy Ghost. There was a reason and a purpose behind each word that they wrote, inspired by God. There was an audience. There was a context. There was a purpose, a surrounding an event that they were writing about specifically. And it's important to go in and mine that out and find out what they were saying rather than us reading it thousands of years later and saying, this is what I think they're saying. It's a big difference. So what we wanna do is we wanna read and we're going to start and we're going to read chapter 26. We're gonna read all of it. 
Now, I know that this is not the normal way to do a Bible study on, on the internet. Many times people frown at that. And, you know, that's why you have PowerPoints because you put clips and snippets, you know, lines. Well, sometimes again, that, that parsing and, and snippets and sound bites sometimes lead to misunderstanding and teaching. So we're going to read the whole thing. It's just the way I do it. Because also, when we read the word of God, then what we're doing is we're reading the word of God itself. It's, it's not my view of it or my interpretation if it's what the word of God says. And then, then we'll go back and we draw from what we read rather than impose something on it. So having said that, uh, chapter 26, and it came to pass in the 11th year. So as we learn that Judah went into captivity in during three raids. The first was under Jehoiakim. The second was under Jehoiakim. And then the third was under Zedekiah. Under Jehoiakim, Daniel and his uh, companions were taken into captivity. You can read that and see it in Daniel chapter number one. Then under Jehoiakim, the second raid, that's when Ezekiel was taken into Babylon. And then so now Daniel is serving in Nebuchadnezzar's court, and Ezekiel is in Babylon prophesying these things and writing these things. So he, so he gives us the, the time. It was the 11th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim. Because Ezekiel started his ministry, if you remember past lessons, Ezekiel started his ministry in the fifth year of Jehoiakim's captivity. So now he's bringing up this uh, a judgment against Tyre in the 11th year. So we've got the significance. He's given us even dates and times of what's going on here. So let's go on. It was the 11th year in the first day of the month that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, son of man, because that Tyrus has said against Jerusalem, aha, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee as the sea causes its waves to come up. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus. Again, pay attention. This is judgment against Tyrus, the nation, the city. We're going to explore all of that. But this is what he says is going to happen. Pay attention. First, he's going to bring many nations against them, and they're going to come against you like a wave, like a big, giant tidal wave. And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like the top of a rock. It shall be a place for the spreading of nets in the midst of the sea. For I have spoken it, saith the Lord God, and it shall become a spoil to the nations. And her daughters, which are in the field, shall be slain by the sword. And they shall know that I am the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus, who? Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, a king of kings, from the north, with horses and with chariots, and with horsemen and companies of much people. And he shall slay with the sword the daughters in the field. And he shall make a fort against thee, and cast a mount against thee, and lift up the buckler against thee. And they shall set engines of war against thy walls, and with his axes he shall break down your towers. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover you. Your walls shall shake at the noise of the horsemen, of his wheels, and of his chariots. And he shall enter into your gates, as men enter into a city wherein is a breach. With the hooves of his horses shall he tread down all your streets. He shall slay your people with the sword, and your strong garrisons shall go down to the ground. And your riches, they shall make a spoil of your riches and make a prey of your merchandise. And they shall break down your walls and destroy your pleasant houses. And they shall lay your stones and your timber and your dust in the midst of the water. You wait and see what the interpretation of that is, the explanation of that, of all of this, what we're reading here. And I will cause the noise of your songs to cease, 
and the sound of the harp shall no more be heard. And I will make thee like the top of a rock. Thou shalt be a place to spread nets upon. Thou shalt be, uh, thou shalt be built no more. For I, the Lord, have spoken, it saith the Lord God. Thus saith the Lord God to Tyrus, shall not the isle shake at the sound of your fall when the wounded cry, when the slaughter is made in the midst of thee? Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put off their broidered garments. They shall clothe themselves with trembling. They shall sit upon the ground and shall tremble at every movement and be astonished at thee. And they shall take up a lamentation for thee and say to thee, how art thou destroyed? Thou wast inhabited of seafaring men, the renowned city, which was strong in the sea. She and her inhabitants, which caused their terror to be on all that haunt it or that live in it or visit it. Now shall the isles tremble in the day of thy fall. Yes, the isles that are in the sea shall be troubled at your departure. For thus saith the Lord God, when I shall make a des make thee a desolate city, like the cities that are not inhabited, when I shall bring up the deep upon thee, and great water shall cover thee, when I will bring thee down with them that descend unto the pit, with the people of the old time, and shall set thee in the low parts of the earth, in the places desolate of old, with them that go down to the pit, that thou shalt uh, that not be inhabited. I shall set my glory in the land of the living. I will make you a terror, and you shall be no more. You, uh, though thou be sought for, yet you shall never be found again, saith the Lord God. Wow, it's a mouthful. But let us uncover it. Let's go down through it. First of all, remember, as we went through Ammon, we saw the origins of their dealings with Israel, Moab, the other nations. We're going to do the same thing with Tyre. Tyre. Let's look at the word The word Tyre itself, or Tyrus. Tyre, Tyrus, the same thing. It means a rock. It also means a cliff or a sharp rock or boulder. And this is important because this is where they were situated. This is where they get their name. It, was, it also means a refuge, strength, strong, fortifying. It is also possible that Tyre finds its roots in Tarshish. Tarshish and Tyre are often mentioned together throughout scripture. Well, who was Tarshish? Tarshish was the second son of Yavon, the grandson of Japheth. Remember Shem, Ham, Japheth, Noah's three sons, they, the world was repopulated. Well, this is where Tarshish comes from. He is the grandson of Japheth. Tyre is mentioned in the Pentateuch. Oh, I'm sorry. Tyre is not mentioned in the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is the first five books of Moses. It's not mentioned there. But first it's called the strong city of Tyre in Joshua 1929. Remember we mentioned about Joshua? When he went and conquered the land, well, this is where he first mentions Tyre, and it's referred to as the strong city. So again, it's, it's gaining a name for, for many centuries, a long time. Also, 2 Samuel 24 and 7 calls it the stronghold of Tyre. If you remember when David uh, numbered the people, he had Joab and his men go and number the people, and this thing displeased God. Well, they went and it was telling uh, their, the boundaries where they were going, and they went as far as the, the stronghold of Tyre. Then also in Isaiah chapter 23, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter 23 is where Isaiah prophesies about Tyre. Remember again, we talk about prophecy in context, because each of these prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they all prophesy about these nations. Well, if we look at Isaiah 23, we see what Isaiah says about uh, Tyre, what, what kind of character this city was. Uh, Isaiah calls it the crowning city. And in the verse number 11, he calls it a merchant city. Keep that in mind. When we get to Ezekiel chapter number 27, we're going to see the significance of them being a merchant city. 
They were called the renowned city. We just read that in Ezekiel 26. Also, Isaiah, in his prophecy against them, he called them the joyous city. He called them the pride of all glory. I mean, this is important. Remember, we talk about drawing the meaning. So when we get to chapter 26, 27, and 28, we're going to get a clear picture of what Ezekiel was saying against this great nation known as Tyre. Their merchants were princes, and their traders were the honorable of all the earth. That's what Isaiah tells us. They were the merchandise mart of the world. All the nations of the known world at that time did business with Tyre. They were the famous island city, the ruler of the sea. Their naval power once spread around the whole world. They were the mighty gateway to the sea, the Mediterranean Sea. And they were also known for their wisdom. Keep that in mind. <clears throat> Tyre was an ancient major seaport of the Phoenicians. It was situated north of Israel, 25 miles south of Sidon, which is the sister city in the Bible, you'll hear, uh, you'll read uh, Tyre and Sidon mentioned uh, quite a bit together. Then it was 35 miles north of Mount Carmel, where the famous showdown of Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of the grove during the days of King Ahab and Jezebel. Uh, what, what type of island, city, island was Tyrus? It consisted of two cities. There was a rocky coastal city on the mainland, and I'm going to show you maps of that so you can get an image in your mind. And then there was a small island city. The rocky mountains of Lebanon stood behind the plain of Tyre, making it easy to defend because it had the sea on the west. The Mediterranean was on the west of it. The mountains were on the east. We're going to look and see that there was a mountain range that protected them from many nations. And then also several rocky cliffs all around it. This made it difficult for enemies to invade. This is a, a, an image here. Let me get out my little, if I can pull up my little trusty marker. And I don't normally get it. Here we are. So as we see, here's Ty Tyre. There's Sidon, his sister city. And this is in the coast, this is Phoenicia. And obviously this is the Mediterranean Sea, the Great Sea. And let's look and see where they're situated. Here's Mount Carmel, we mentioned, to the south of it. And here's Israel. And the land here, here's Judah, way down here to the south of it. And here is Jerusalem, which eventually Nebuchadnezzar is gonna come and invade in Jerusalem. And look at all of the, the, the reference to all of these other nations that we mentioned. Here's Philist, Phil, the Philistines right here. Then we have Edom over here, Moab. And where are those? And there's Ammon. These are all the nations that eventually, they, they were had a long history with Israel, uh, uh, sometimes good relations, sometimes bad relations. Uh, here's Syria. But then when Nebuchadnezzar finally came in 586 BC and conquered Jerusalem, all of these nations that have been warring against Israel, they saw this as their chance to come in and loot and rob and kill and take their vengeance and all of those things. So that gives you, but look at Tyre here. The sea protects it to the west. And see these little dark spots here? These are mountain ranges. Here's Mount Lebanon. There's Mount Hermon. And all of these are these are mountain ranges. So they're very well protected because over here to the east is where the major uh, uh, superpowers, sorry about that, lost it. The major superpowers, Assyria and uh, Assyria up here, over here to the east and Babylon further down here to the east. And so they were, they were prevented for many years from invading and getting to Tyre. They were, they were an island fortress. They were protected. Uh, and so that's significant. Uh, so keep that in mind as we as we move on with our lesson. Let's stop that. Turn that off. All righty, so it gives you a visual. Now let's look at this also. We see that now we have, uh, it's, it's, it's made up of an island. Tyre is made up of island and it's made up of mainland. 
So there's an old mainland, and then there's a an island that made up Tyre. Keep this. I'm going to show this picture later on in our study. Uh, the significant. Uh, now look at this. Here's the mainland. Well, I suppose I should go back to my little my little uh, marker. Let's get my little spotlight. Here's the mainland. This is a satellite image, a current modern day satellite image, the, the mainland. And then also here is the island. This is the island of Tyre. But notice this stretch of land. This Notice this land bridge here. Where did this land bridge come from? Let's get another image. Here's the mainland, Tyre. There is the island. But here is something that was not always a part of the equation. This is a land bridge. We're going to look and see in scripture where this land bridge came from. Let's take another picture. The mainland. There's a land bridge, and there's the island. Another image, satellite image. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going over this. This is the city of Tyre, modern. Here's the land bridge, and there's the island. At one time, this land bridge was not there. And Ezekiel 26 tells us and gives a prediction on how that land bridge gets there. So now, that, that put an image in your mind. Tyre was made up of... Uh, of, a, of, a, of a mainland city and an island city. <clears throat> so what we're going to do is we're going to stop right there, give you something to chew on, and uh, this is going to be our next slide. So look for this next slide. I'm going to try to do a series of lessons today, just one after another, so that we can get caught up to where we are. Because what we're doing is we're, we're also doing this in a Bible study, our, our normal Bible study in the evening. And so obviously we are probably two or three lessons behind uh, because of this the events that I, I mentioned. So we want to try to get caught up to, to where we are currently. And so our, our next slide will deal with Tyrus as the ancient city. What we're doing is we're building the context here, just like we found out who the Ammonites were, their origins, their dealings with Israel, the Moabites, their origins, their dealing with Israel. We also want to look at Tyre its origins is dealing with Israel so that we can get an understanding of the context so that when we see, when Ezekiel makes his prediction against Tyre, we will see the significance of what Ezekiel is trying to say. So we're going to stop right there. Amen. We're going to stop right there and we'll see you on the next lesson. God bless you. Goodbye.